Old Testament reading this morning from Isaiah chapter 44. I can ask you to please turn with me your Bibles to Isaiah 44 verses 1 through 8 and then to Romans 8, 29 through 30. This is talking about the sovereignty of God over his people. This is the Lord's chosen, his chosen ones. And listen to these words. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour out water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offering and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowering streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand, the Lord's. And name himself by the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from old and declared it? You are my witnesses. There's no God besides me. There is no rock. I know not any. Praise God and amen. Now over to Romans chapter 8. And we'll just um, we'll go back to verse 28. And again, tying into last week's sermon. And even the song we just sang, Romans 8, 28. Paul says that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you so much. Thank you for bringing us here together. I thank you for this church, Lord God. I thank you for the heart of these people who love you so much who show their absolute dependence upon you in their lives each and every day. Lord, we look to you. To to whom shall we go? Where can we go, Lord God? There's no place and no one but Jesus Christ. So I thank you, Lord, for the for the depth, for the for approaching your word and the Christian life in such a serious fashion, truly seeking to glorify you, Lord God. We don't do this in our own strength, but only by your grace that's poured out upon us, by the faith that you grant us. So please bless this word this morning, Lord God, to your glory and for our good. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. He is so good. And he's so good to us, even as we're going through Romans. It is so amazing. It's just so wonderful as you see the structure of Romans. It's so deeply theological, and it's that letter you'd love to have to learn the doctrines. Absolutely. And that's Romans. But it's also just so practical, so tender, so wonderful. Think about that congregation that was reading it, just not just learning the the teachings and the doctrines of the Christian faith, but how to live as Christians and understanding that, Paul is writing, obviously, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to not only educate, but to encourage his people to, to, to live deeply for Christ, to depend deeply upon Jesus Christ and not upon themselves. So in chapter 8, and you know this as we've been going through it, what he's doing for us It's just giving us assurance after assurance of our salvation if we're in Jesus Christ. He's really, really comforting us. And he's doing that because we need assurance. He's doing it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit because you know you need it, right? Oh, you of little faith. How how many of you fit in that category? I know that I do. You know, why why do we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ? We start off really well, oftentimes, even like Peter, coming and walking on the water, but we take our eyes off Christ and we sink really fast, don't we? Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Right? I believe. I believe. I know you believe. But another breath we say, help my unbelief. We're so easily entangled and taken away from Christ. We're plagued with the, just different de- degrees of doubt at times, if we're honest with ourselves as Christians. Now, we shouldn't be. 
And this is what Paul especially is bringing out in this chapter. There's deep theology here, of course, and we've been talking about that, but it's really meant to comfort you and to assure you and give you confidence in your faith as a Christian. Deep, deep theology concerning salvation. So this is what we have. And that's the whole book, the whole book of Romans. Because if you think about it in the beginning, especially the first 118 through 321, we learn all about our sinfulness. Just how sinful we really are. He doesn't, you know, there's, there's no coding over it, right? We can't escape it. We are sinners. We are depraved. We are enemies of God. We learn this. And so we're just overwhelmed with the depth of our sin, the nature of sin, the damage that it does, the degree of sin in our lives. That's that's for Romans 118 to 321, really. But then there's a deep theology concerning our salvation and the wonderful gift of grace. Amen. Sinners who can't save themselves are justified by him. We're made right as he pours out his grace upon his people. So we're made right with God. Romans 4 and 5. Amen. Praise God. Romans 6 and 7. The reality of salvation. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer that person we were. We, we, we say no. We're able to say no to sin and live to Christ. We're cognizant of that sin in our lives. We've been raised with Him. Sin has lost its grip. We're encouraged to walk by the Spirit, not according to the flesh. So, it goes on. The battle with sin rages on. And here's the deal. Far too often, we give ourselves over to our sin. We just do. We know what the word teaches. We want to obey him. But how many times at the first temptation, at the first something that takes you off your game, you go right to sin. You know, you lose your temper. You go this way. You go that way. You fall into that temptation. We do that. We repent. We restored. We're reconciled. We're forgiven. But before long, like Paul says in Romans 7, here we are again. I do the things that I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I want to do. I do the very things that I hate doing. That is the reality of the Christian life. Paul knows it says he's writing Romans. So that brings us to chapter 8, right? We not only want to see the deep theology here, but we want to see the deep love of the Lord to provide you, to provide us as Christians with a great measure of comfort, really of assurance that you are a Christian, that you do belong to him if you're truly trusting in Christ. So there's a great measure of confidence, not in ourselves, but in Christ who keeps us. Assurance after assurance after assurance. That's what he's doing. He's not going to let us go no matter how far we stray. He's going to leave the 99 to come and gather the one. He's going to wait for us like the father waited for the prodigal son to come back. He's going to bring us back to himself through the Holy Spirit who himself, the Holy Spirit himself is great assurance as he lives in us. He's giving us in Romans 8 just just assurance, right? Just like if you're a parent, you want to give your kids, you're teaching your little kid to swim. You want to give that kid great assurance that, that you're going to be there for them, right? You're not going to just throw them in. Well, some, some of you parents might do that. Just throw, you know, you're going to swim. They make you swim like that. No. If you're a parent, at least these days, you're going to be right there with that child and you're going to tell that kid, listen, I am right here. You know, daddy's not going to let you go down. Mommy's going to be right here for you. So you hold the bait and they, you know, start to swim a little bit and then you, you back off and say, okay, now I'm going to put you underwater a little bit, but, but I'm going to be right here. So you assure them nothing's going to happen to you. You're going to be okay. They don't know this. They're crying. They have some confidence. Okay, but then they're scared, but then they do it, right? So then you let them swim a little bit. You back off a little bit. So daddy's right here. You just come here. I'm not going to let you go down. I'm telling you, I'm right here. So I'm just going to back off a little bit and let you, so I'm not going to hold you anymore, right? And that's what we do. We assure them. We're, it's going to be, we're right here. We're not going to go anywhere. Nothing is going to happen to you. That's what he's doing here for us. That's what Paul's doing in chapter 8. Because we need it. He need, we need that assurance. So we talked about in the beginning, look, there's no condemnation in Christ. You could be assured that there's no condemnation in Christ. Your sin no longer separates you from your Savior. Jesus isn't going to say to you, oh yes, I love you. Come into my kingdom prepared for you. But I have one thing. No, 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 no. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The law does not condemn us. Christ has fulfilled that law. We've been driven to Christ by the law. We've been adopted into his family. We've talked all about these things. We've had sermons on these. 
We're part of his household. How amazing is that to know that you are part of the household of God? You are son and daughter of God. And you are treated with all the privileges and the rights, full privileges and rights of sons and daughters of God. Do you realize that? Do you rest on that assurance that I belong to you and you belong to me and nothing can separate us from that love? He tells us that we're heirs with Christ. Everything that belongs to Christ belongs to us. There's so much more waiting for us. And that for all eternity. So the hardships that we go through now cannot compare to the glory we will have then. That's assurance. Do you feel that? Do you understand that? Do you believe that? That you belong to him? Part of what Paul is doing here is showing these people in a very practical, sound way that you belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Even when we don't know how to pray, he prays for us. Every circumstance, as we looked at last week, every single circumstance, every single situation in your life is part of God's plan for you. And ultimately, he will be glorified, just as we sang, and it will be for your good. Whether it's your growth in the faith, growth in your knowledge, growth in dependence, whatever you need to be learning. We talked all about that last week. Now, we come to this famous verse, especially if you're Reformed. Um, believers. This is what's known as the golden chain of redemption, right? He says this in verse uh, 29, for all those he foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he also called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. We love that. There's such rich theology in that. We see God's sovereignty in salvation. That's so soteriological that you know we can't get over that. But you need to remember, you need to remember, we can't isolate these two verses or confine, you know, the, it, it just to God's sovereignty and salvation. It certainly speaks to that. But we can't, we have to remember the broader context. Everything I've been talking to you about up to this point, the broader context, he's bringing forth these things to assure us. This is how sure your salvation is. This is how much you can count on God. This is why you shouldn't doubt. This is why you shouldn't be afraid. This is why you should have that confidence in Christ that you belong to him. That's the context context in which this is found. He speaks of salvation in a way that should leave no doubt if you're truly trusting in Christ, no matter how much you struggle with sin, no matter how much you struggle with doubt. Amen? That's the foundation. That's what I want you to have in your mind as we look at these things. They're not just these soteriological concepts of you know, predestination, sovereignty of God. It is that. But it's more than that. Because it's because of this that you can have full confidence, not in yourself. Oh, I might lose my salvation or I could go away. No, 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 no. That I am his. And nothing could separate me from that love. Now, that's coming up next week. But nevertheless, here we are. So what I want to do this morning, rather quickly, is look at five realities regarding your redemption in Christ. Remember last week, all things work together for good. Ultimately, they work together for good because you belong to him. Amen and praise God. Because wherever you are, that's the situation he has you in. And if you have him in whatever situation you are in, that's all you really truly need. So it teaches us not to worry about our circumstances in order to have peace, grace, salvation, or another person, or anything else like that. No matter whatever else happens, you always have him. And he means more to you than anybody else or anything else. Any pain, any sorrow, any difficulty. That was last week. Now... Here's how you know you could belong to him. And he gives us this wonderful, this wonderful chain, golden chain of redemption, as it's called, for us. And three things happen here. It talks, it starts in eternity past, talks about present, and then he goes to eternity future. It's all there. It's just everything is there for us. He goes and says this. For those he foreknew. Let's stop right there. For those he foreknew. Now, this is eternity past. Before you ever existed, before he ever existed, he knew you. Understand? He knew you. That means that he elected you to salvation. He chose you before you even existed for salvation. Now listen, the popular view of this idea of foreknowledge doesn't mean that God elected you for salvation. He didn't choose you for salvation because he knew that one day you would choose him, that you would choose to place your trust in him. So on that basis, like looking down the times, seeing that you're going to choose Christ, 
Therefore, he elects you to salvation. That's popular. You, you could see where you might think that. Hey, look down, see if you're going to choose him. On that basis, he chooses to save you. That's difficult because you have to start asking the question, who chooses who for salvation? Right? Like, am I, that means I'm choosing him. Well, then, since you're choosing me, then I'll choose you. Then I'll elect you. That's, that's hard. You really have to wrestle with that. That's a difficult one because that puts it on us and not on God who is sovereign. Another huge problem when we think about that is verse chapters one, two, three, one through three. Why do you think he gave us one through three? Because it shows us how sinful we are, the depth of our sin, how we're not able to choose him apart from him doing something in us first. That's, that's the whole behind chapter three. There's no one who does good, not even one. We're not even able. We suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So in and of ourselves, we're not just going to one day say, oh, okay, yes, I think I'm going to choose God and then, you know, he'll choose me. That's, that's a huge, huge problem. Apart from God working, who would choose him? How, how can we, knowing what we know about our sin, the nature of sin, the depth of sin, the corruption of sin, choose him? That's something you have to really wrestle with. And, and good Christians wrestle with this all, all the time. People on, on both sides of this. But remember the greater context. This is for our comfort. Check this out. More than, well, not more than, but in addition to the, the problem we have with sin and who's choosing who, the word for no, the way it's used here, doesn't simply mean prescience. It doesn't simply mean that God sees and God knows. Of course he does. He's omniscient. He knows everything. But because he's ordained that. And, and so he knows. He's, he's omniscient. But the word itself, when he says, I foreknew you, that is a very, very, um, it's, it speaks to something much, much, much deeper than just looking down and saying, oh, I knew that you were going to pick me, so I'll choose you. That word connotes a richness, an intimacy, a depth of, of really knowing. So you can know about somebody or you can know somebody. Do you know what I mean? There's something like, oh, I know you. I really do know you. Not just, you know, the choices that you make or something about you, but I know you. So I know you better than you know yourself. That kind of thing. That It's that idea. In Genesis chapter 4, we're, we're told that Adam knew his wife and then they conceived the child. There's that, that intimacy, that closeness, that depth. To know to foreknow in this way is not simply knowing about or just having information. So that would just have information. I have the information that you're going to choose me, so I'll choose you. It's personal. It's, it's, it's knowledge of. It's setting of your affection upon. You know what I mean? I'm setting my affection upon you. I know you deeply. Like I know my wife. My wife knows me. We know our children. You know, it's, it's that kind of love. Jesus said, in chapter 10 of John, verse 14, he says this. And I want you to think about this. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my own know me. Those who belong to me know me because I know them. Right? And then he goes on Matthew chapter 7. Look at this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, went to the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, the one who really trusts. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out many demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. I didn't know you. I didn't know you in that way. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now look, of course he knew them. He knew who they were. He knew they were doing because he knows everything. He is omniscient. But he's saying, I never knew you in a saving way. I never placed my affection on you. My salvation never given to you in that way. I never knew you. And they even have the outward manifestations of being a Christian, but they weren't truly trusting. So Jesus says, I never knew you. How about with Jeremiah? Jeremiah 1 5. It says, Before, before I formed you in the womb, where's that take us back to eternity past? Eternity past. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Not just knowing what you were going to do, but I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. It wasn't an accident. He just didn't grow in. It just didn't kind of happen. Luckily, oh, it's his course of life. No, it was predetermined by God because he knew him. He belonged to him. Do you understand? I want you to wrestle with this because it's a, it's a deep concept. Galatians 1.6. 
Paul says this, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, what? He set me apart? That's another way of knowing, choosing, electing, setting aside. Before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. Paul is saying this. Paul saying, but who set me apart before I was born? He, he didn't, he didn't simply see Paul one day choosing him and then he was going to be, you know, this, this person who he became. Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, think about Paul's conversion. That's, a, that's really a dramatic picture of how God saves his people that he, that, that he sets apart, that he knows. Saul was out persecuting Christians, but he could still say, before I was born, you set me apart. How could, that's by his grace. He was set apart, he was elect, elected, he was known by God. And then Galatians 4, 8 and 9. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those who by nature are God, are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, and there it is, but now what Paul does, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to become once more? That's the idea. He knew he knew them before they knew him, right? So Paul is saying that as well. Listen, examples could be multiplied. I'm not up here trying to prove this this you know point of foreknowledge, foreordination. It's just there. And if you think about it, and you think of God's sovereignty in light of our sinfulness, how this is used, because we could multiply examples all day long, but check it out. Here's what he's saying, and here's what I want you to understand. He knew you. He set his love on you before you existed. That's so much more than looking down the hallways of time, seeing if you're going to do something, and then deciding to save you. See, that kind of leaves it in our hands. We're here. That comfort comes knowing that God knew me from before the foundation of the world because he set his love on me before the foundation of the world. You understand? We trust him because he chose us. That's a, that, when you talk about that foreknowledge, think about that. Think about the depth of that love. Think about the comfort that that brings. It's not that, you know, okay, well, I just, you know, luckily I chose him then. No, 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 no. When I look back, when I think about my salvation, it was God who loved me all along. And he set his love on me. So because you've been elected, he goes on to say this. He said, you know, he foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined. We'll stop right there. There's that word, predestination. And I know there's a lot of Christians who get upset when you talk about predestination. Predestin- we all believe in predestination. It might just be variations of it, but you know, some people just, if you, even in certain Christian circles, you say predestination. Oh, that's a bad word. You can't even say it. It's, that's what's taught in scripture. Because you've been elected, he predestined you to salvation. In other words, he determined to save you. He he elected you, set you apart, set his love on you, and he determined to save you. It was going to happen. It was going, you were going to be saved. You are going to come to Christ. You understand? That's what I mean. You were destined to believe. You reached that destination as a believer. That day that you were converted, you reached that destination. It's not fate. It's not chance. It's not luck. It's not accident. It's not you coming to some knowledge, a light bulb coming on. It is him opening your heart so you trust and believe in him. That's it. He's sovereign. That's what it means. And there's great comfort in that because it's not me. It's him. If it's him, I could trust him. I can't trust myself because I'm fickle. So you have people that say, you know what, you could lose your salvation. Well, that person lost their salvation. They need to be, they need to be saved again and again and again and again. That's not true. It's not true. That's not, that takes everything away from, from, from the Lord. Your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. When? Revelation 13, 8. Now this is the negative, but check this out. And all who dwell on earth will worship. He's talking about the beast. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. Who was not? That means if you are, that your name was written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundations of the world. He put it there. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. Because it says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless, in love he predestined us for adoption 
to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. The purpose of his will. Then verse 11, he says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Aren't you thankful for that? That it's his comfort? That's what Paul is doing. He's assuring us of our salvation because it is God's salvation towards us. Now, I know we want to say this, and it's a natural inclination to say, well, it's just not fair. It doesn't seem right, does it? Because he saves some and not others. And I think the big sticking point for a lot of us is it doesn't seem right that God would say, you don't even have a chance, kind of. You know, it's just, you're just, you're either chosen or you're not. And that's a, that's a subject of many debates and many differences among wonderful Christian people, people who truly love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we always want to be charitable and gracious with that. I want to make that the topic of this sermon because that's not the scope of this sermon. We're talking about the assurance. But I do want to ask the question, which one of you deserves salvation in any way? Not one person. Which one of you does not deserve the wrath of God because of your sin? See, that... Now, if God chooses to pardon some according to his purpose, as we just read, according to his own will in that way, if he chooses to pardon some and place his love on some, and they receive mercy, does that mean it's not fair that others receive justice? See, the idea is we all deserve that justice of God. We do. We're, we're rightly condemned. He chooses to pardon some that they receive mercy. Others simply receive justice. Nobody receives injustice or injustice. Now, this is a long conversation, and again, it's not the scope of the sermon, that's the idea behind this. It's by his grace that we're saved. We're unworthy. We don't deserve it. He gives it to us. If you receive mercy, then all you could do is praise him. All you could do is rejoice. All you could do is rest in that assurance of his salvation, that you belong to him, that he knew you, that he predestined you to salvation. Amen? That's it. That's it. Why me, Lord? Why me? Here's why. Now, we move from the realm of eternity. So you have foreknowing, foreknew you, and predestination. That's eternity past. Now we come into time and space. He goes on and he says this. In those, verse 30, whom he also predestined, he also called. He called you. Now, we need to distinguish between calling. It's very important that we do this. Again, this is a great comfort here. The outward call and the inward call of the gospel. What's the outward call of the gospel? Yeah, you just preach it. You tell, you, it's a full, free, continuous offering of the gospel to every single person that you meet everywhere you go. You tell people about Jesus Christ. That's our duty. That's a privilege that we have. Somebody spoke the gospel to you, pointed you to a church, gave you a Bible to read. That's what we do all the time. That is the outward call of God without distinction everywhere. We never say, well, I'm not going to tell you because I don't like. No, we tell everybody. We tell, we shout it from the rooftop. So we bring forth the gospel with power, with conviction, we pray for, we try to convince them. We Everything we can do by our strength that the Lord gives us everywhere, all the time, it's of first importance to us. So you preach that gospel, you never hold it back. Even if somebody can't stand you and tells you, don't preach it to me, you still preach it to them and you still pray for them. They need to hear that gospel message. Paul said it's of first importance, right? First Corinthians 15, Paul says, I deliver to you as first importance before anything else, before we do anything else, I give to you what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. The gospel in a nutshell right there. That is the outward call of God. Understand, that goes to everybody fully and freely. Now, we're talking about the calling that he talks about here when he says, I called you. That is the inward or the effectual or the effective call of God, and that's by the Holy Spirit. That's when you, you might have heard the gospel who knows how many times growing up, right? Blah, blah, blah. Hear the gospel. But there's that day. There's that point in time when 
the lights go on. Right, Matt Cappers? The lights go on and that's it. You see, you know, you see the sinner that you are. You see the Savior that Christ is. You repent, you believe, you receive, you rest on Jesus Christ. That's not you. That's the inward call. That's the Holy Spirit opening your eyes and your heart. That's what he does. We respond to that. But I can't convince you. I can tell you and I need to tell you, but that's the inward call of God. And when he calls, that's effective. You will come to him. Acts 2, 37. Look at this. Peter is preaching. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Right there, cut to the heart. Boom. That's it. And then they asked the question, um, brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That was the answer. Believe in Jesus Christ. That's the Holy Spirit working in them. Acts 16, verse 14. Now one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. So she knew about God. She knew about God. She ready to come to church. She'd done this, done that. She knew about him, but she didn't know him until worshiper of God. Then the Lord, what? Opened her heart to pay attention to what was being said by Paul. She was baptized, received. Her family was that. That is the inward call of God. That's the effectual call of God. God, as his sheep, we hear his voice and we will come to him. Right? That's the calling. That's what makes you a Christian. I can't make you a Christian. Only he does that. So he goes on. Number four, we're getting through this pretty quick, I think. Um, our justification. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we spent several sermons on this. But look at number four. He says, those who be predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Let's stop there. Justification. That's the finished work of Christ applied to you in time and in space. We spent several weeks on this, so we're not going to spend too much time this morning. But I do want to look at Shorter Catechism. uh, Question 33. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace. Free, nothing we do. Where he pardons all of our sins, accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. If you could remind, just just memorize one catechism question, this might be it, man. It's such a great one. Just talks about that that great exchange of justification, being made right before the Lord, declared not guilty because of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So Christ who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. You know this very well if you're a member of this church. This is the great exchange that's made in redemption. The great exchange, all of our sin, you sinners, us sinners, all of our sin, past, present, and future, when we trust in Christ, is imputed or stamped to him. Do you know that? All of your sin is given to Jesus Christ. He pays for it on the cross. But not only does he pay for it so we're forgiven, we also receive his righteousness because of his sinless life. Do you understand? So you are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks at you, who does he see? Does he see sinner you? Still struggling? No, 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 no. You're declared not guilty and righteous forensically. Why? Because you trust in Jesus Christ. He sees the righteous robes of Christ that you are clothed with. On that basis, he declares you not guilty. You come into my presence. Doesn't that give you chills? Amen. It should. This is our assurance in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our justification. The imputed righteousness of Christ. Our sins to him. His righteousness to us. So God accepts you as righteous. Accept it. There's deep assurance there, isn't there? This is what it's all about. It's it, This is very theological. But you see the assurance that comes from this. That's what Paul wants you to get at. He wants you to understand that this is a salvation that can't go away. That you could trust. That you could know. I may not always know how I'm doing as a Christian. You know, I'm going to struggle at times. How am I doing, Lord? Do I really believe? Am I really trusting? I know that I do. I do. Ah. And we go back and forth, right? I may not always know how I'm doing, but I always know whose I am. We belong to him. Amen. And that makes all the difference in the world. And that's what Paul's talking about here. We belong to him and he holds on to us and he's not going to let us go. That's what's coming through. And that's why we want to live for him. I know whose I am and who I always will be, will always be his. We know that because he goes on and says this. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Okay, so now we're leaving the time again. We were in eternity past. And then we were in time. Now we're going to eternity future. He said, you're going to be glorified. Amen. That looks forward. Everything is covered. It's all, it's all there for us. Those he glorified. Glorified reaches beyond this life. It stretches into eternity future, endless eternity. When this life ends, and here's the promise, and here's the comfort, where do you go? Do you go to some holding place for a little while? Do you go to purgatory here until, like, this is a big deal with the justification. If you were raised Roman Catholic, you know that you must be made righteous, completely, fully, objectively, until you're accepted into heaven. That means purgatory. We don't know how long that is. Justification by faith means forensically Christ's righteousness is granted to us. Right? So that's why Jesus could say to the thief on the cross, when will you be with me in paradise? In a million years. Today you'll be with me in paradise, no matter what you did. Because you believe in me. When our life ends, we will enter into his glory. Amen. Praise God. What assurance is that? Amen. In his presence, made perfect in holiness, while our bodies rest in the grave until the glorious resurrection, until he returns. Then we'll be raised up in glory, openly acknowledged, acquitted before the world, made perfectly blessed for how long? All eternity. That's that's the hope that we have. That's what he's saying here. So you read it, not just theologically. Yes, of course. But read it. Also, in a sanctifying way, just very, so these people were reading it, saying, man, this, I am his. This is what what awaits me, too. Beyond the theological points that are there, this is truth that I could rely on, that I know that he loves me, that I'm assured that I am going to be with him if I'm trusting in him. So everything we talked about this morning is grounded in eternity past. He knew you. He set his love on you. He set you apart. Again, why? That's a mystery. He predestined you to life. That's eternity past. He called you and he justified you. That's present. That's when you were born again. That's You came to him and now you're believing you're living that life now. You will be glorified. That is that is the, fi- the fullness. It finds its fullness in eternity. So we've grounded in eternity past, comes to fruition in time, finds its fullness in the eternal state. That's what he's saying here. Believe and do not doubt. Believe and do not doubt. You have no ground for doubting. Come on. And Jesus said, oh, you a little faith, like I said earlier. Why are you doubting me? Don't you trust me? Don't you believe my words? Don't you believe my promises? It's true. Therefore, we as Christians should live with great confidence. You should live with great confidence in Jesus Christ. You should have a deep sense of gratitude towards Jesus Christ who saved you. You should have courage, a boldness, and fearlessness for Jesus Christ. We should be bold. We should be fearless. We should be courageous as Christians. We should be doing everything we can with our lives for Jesus Christ, completely giving ourselves to him, wholeheartedly devoted to him, honoring him, obeying him because of who he is. And what he's done for us. Understand? We have great confidence in him. For everything he's done. We should be assured of our salvation. And therefore living for him in ways. That bring honor and glory to his name. Stop playing games. Stop worrying about yourself so much. Get your eyes off yourself and onto Jesus Christ. The author and perfecter of your faith. Let love cover a multitude of sins. Stop with the pettiness. Know that everything happens in his providence. It's not just, he's doing something in your life. And he's working it out for good. We sang it this morning, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. No one understand this. Because when you have assurance, that gives you confidence, doesn't it? When you're not assured, when you're not sure, when you don't know, you're always worried about it. I don't know, man. So I'm not going to be confident in other areas. But when I know, that he's my savior and he has me. The possibilities are endless. They're living a life that's faithful, that's exemplary in Jesus Christ, that's not self-centered, that's not selfish, it's not always so worried and so afraid. It's bold. 
and you're living for others. Stop playing these little games and, and, and trust in him. Now, it gets even better as we move on towards the end of this chapter as he continues to assure us. And we know that nothing will separate us from his love, but that's building up to the crescendo as we move on. So let's pray.